Hello and welcome to our community conversation. Today we are going to be discussing, or I'm going to hopefully help you answer the question, are you still counting calories and why? So today we're going to go over a little bit of history about how the calorie uh, came about, and then I'm going to help you hopefully figure out why counting calories could be the thing that that is holding you back from looking and feeling your best and living your most authentic life. So welcome. If you are new, my name is Diane. I am your fasting mindset coach. For the past five years here in this community, I have been teaching women how to incorporate intermittent fasting to help them look and feel their best and live their most authentic life as they're going through hormonal changes. So I know for a lot of women, the aging woman aspect of our community here um, can be a little bit of a trigger phrase. And so I wanted to explain really quickly today what that means to us here in this community. I truly believe that all women who are given an opportunity to plant their two feet on the ground and start a new day are actually aging women. So aging doesn't have to necessarily mean that you are old or that you're even falling apart. It just means that you are having the opportunity to live another day and every day that we get to live, we are in fact aging. So please uh, make sure that you consider that when you're seeing that phrase here in this community, we are doing the work to age successfully. And a lot of the women here in this community are thriving in the aging process and we hope that you will be able to do the same hanging out with us. So do me a favor if you're jumping on live, leave me a comment in the comment section. I want to know you're here. If you're catching this on the rebroadcast, I also ask that you take a second to leave me a comment. I love hearing from you guys. It makes me feel like I'm not talking to myself. So if you can leave me a comment and um, let me know if this uh, topic today resonated with you, I would totally appreciate it. So are you still counting calories? So where did this calorie counting concept even come from? Well, believe it or not, it came about in the 1800s. A scientist by the name of Wilbur Atwater actually discovered the calorie by burning food in a water chamber, basically. It was called the bomb calor, uh, what was it called? The calorimeter, calorimeter is what he used to burn food. And basically what he did was he burned food and he broke it down and that created what a calorie was. So it's basically an energy source and what, what it took to get a calorie to or a food to burn down into the water. And that's basically how we came about counting calories. The problem with counting calories is that the food industry or the big box item kind of food processing uh, part of what we do in our nutritional intake and, and we use as our nutritional guide really bought into the calorie counting concept as far as labeling foods. And they used uh, doctor or whatever scientist at water's theory of counting calories as a means to break down food for us then the diet industry picked up on that and that's where we really started using calorie fractions basically or brackets to determine what we were supposed to consume in a day now the problem with calorie counting is that it has no uh, factor or it doesn't allow you to factor in nutrient density at all. It's basically just a makeup of what we consider our macro um, nutrients, right? So our fats, our uh, carbohydrates, and our protein. We know fats are equated out to equal nine calories per gram. Carbs and protein are four. So if you're shooting for a calorie count, there's no real way for you to justify or determine if your body is getting the right nutrients that it needs for itself. And with the processed food industry and the guidelines that they provide, it's really easy for us to justify consuming foods as long as we are staying within the bracketed calorie count that we have determined, or maybe a diet plan or someone else determined is what we we need to sustain our lifestyle. The other problem with calorie counting that was never really considered back in the 1800s was fiber. And fiber back in the day was considered to have a zero calorie component to it because our body doesn't digest fiber. So when we, you might know this if you were on a ketogenic type of plan and you, you know that there's a difference between 
you know, your net carb count and your total carb count. And a lot of times we factor out the net carbs from our total macro count or our total calorie count because we were told that, you know, fiber doesn't really count against us. But what we have learned in recent scientific studies is that we should actually be factoring in fiber. And in fact, fiber does hold a two calorie count, basically, per gram and that our body may not absorb or break down the fiber in a sense but our digestive system does and our microbiome needs that fire a fiber in order to keep itself healthy so we actually are utilizing fiber in kind of the same sense that we're using fats proteins and carbohydrates the other thing or the other reason why counting calories might be um, something that's very problematic for you is the fact that we fall into a lot of these categories or styles of eating. And clean eating is definitely one of those categories or genres or however you want to talk or call it, lifestyles, I guess, of eating that I know for me got me in a lot of trouble. I thought I was clean eating and ended up becoming diabetic. And I was really, really sick with a lot of food intolerances because I was reading labels that made my mind believe that I was doing good when in actuality, I was eating things that were really causing me to have some problems. So I want you to consider Consider that as well. What is it that you think about food or how is it that you think about food when you're deciding what it is you want to put into your body? So I did a really quick calculation of two things that I love to have in my house that I consider very clean foods but are on the opposite ends of what would be the calorie spectrum. So um, kale, for instance, something I absolutely love to eat. I love to bake it. I love to put it as a base of a salad. And per serving, kale has 33 calories calories. So very, very low. And to be totally honest with you, you can only eat so much kale in a sitting, right? So I'm going to feel satiated very quickly, especially if I have some fat with my kale. I usually um, cover it with some avocado oil and eat it with an avocado. Um, and I'm very satiated. So imagine if I only had two servings of kale, but my body was sending me signals that I had all the nutrients that I need and that I was in fact satiated. I didn't need or have the sensation that I needed to eat more. Now, on the flip side of things, I also love Siete brand tortilla chips. I absolutely love them. Ingredients wide, they're definitely a, a clean food in my family. There's nothing in a Siete chip that I have a problem with other than a serving of Siete chips is 293 calories. And I can tell you after a serving, I'm not satiated at all. I can eat an entire bag of Siete chips. So when we are thinking about calories, what I want you to think about instead of am I getting the right amount of calories for my body, I want you to shift your mindset into thinking or asking yourself the question, am I getting the right amount of nutrients in my body? And when I eat this food, how do I look and feel? And when you look and feel, and looking is part of the, the equation as well, if you're looking the way you want to look and you're feeling the way you want to feel after a nutrient-dense meal, then why would calories need to come into that equation? If you're feeling satiated, if you're feeling energized, if you're not having any kind of signs and signals about food intolerances, if you like the way your body is looking, if your brain is energized and processing the way you want it to, if you're sleeping great, then why would we still be stuck on counting calories when our body is sending us all the signals that the choices that we are making are working for us. So in my opinion, and what I have been doing for myself for the past five years has thrown the calorie counting philosophy out the window. I don't even count macros. And I really do just listen to the signs and signals that my body is sending me. And I know enough about nutrition, even the most, um, you know, um, uneducated person on nutrition as far as nutritional certifications or nutritional formal study. We know enough about what nutrient dense food is and what junky food is or processed food is to make very realistic choices for ourselves so that we are eating a more nutrient dense diet. Then you listen to the signs and signals that your body is sending you. If you eat a plate full of food that is nutrient dense, I promise you, you will come way under your calorie count 
per industry standards, but your body will feel satiated and you will have all the nutrients that you need to sustain your life. And that is ultimately the purpose of food is to provide nutrients to our bodies so that we stay healthy and we want to make sure that we are sustaining our life. If you live your life by those guidelines, I promise you, you can take all the stress and all the anxiety and all the mind drama and all of the mind energy that you have to put into counting and tracking your calories and you can just give all that back to yourself by choosing nutrient dense food that just makes sense to you. Now, I also want to uh, put a little footnote in here that I also eat Siete chips. And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad, but when it comes to counting calories, we have to use common sense and ask ourselves, why are we doing this and how is this serving us? Because I can eat a very, very junky processed meal and reach a 1200 calorie limit very quickly, not feel satiated and not be a uh, not fortifying my body with the nutrients that I need to make sure that tomorrow I feel energized and ready to face my day. So I want you to think about some of these things as you're moving forward if you are a calorie counter. Now, if you are a graduate of my Intermittent Fasting for Today's Aging Woman course, you know that we talk about this in some of the lessons in class and we understand why we listen to the hormones that our body is, is, is has been provided with to send these signals for ourselves. Our body is equipped to communicate to us, to tell us the naive one, right? Our brain and our hormones work together to send signals to us so that we can make better informed decisions. So we have to make sure that we are going back and listening to those signs and signals. If you're feeling satiated, if you're energized, if you're feeling like everything's working for you and you still feel like you need to reach a calorie count, even though everything looks and feels great for you, then that is the definition of overeating. If you're forcing food in your mouth after your body is sending you the signal that you're satiated, that is by definition overeating. So learn to listen to your body, learn what nutrient density means for you, and then use that as your guide to make sure that you're getting everything that you need to age successfully. And that is exactly what we're shooting for here. So I hope that takes some stress away. I hope that will buy you some time back in your life. One of the big things about calorie counting and one of the things that I really had problems with and fell short on myself and, and when I was coaching women to count calories, the same thing happened is oftentimes counting calories, unless you're just diligent about it, is an after the fact realization. And if we're not doing the things within our day, if you're counting calories, you're usually also tracking the burning off of calories and what we think is burning off of calories. We can often find ourselves falling short because we are doing things in the after and realizing, oh shoot, I ate too much, or oh shoot, I thought I was gonna work out, or oh shoot, I didn't do what I thought I was gonna do. And we know that over consuming anything just creates a backup in our system, and that's where we really fall into the problems that we're not happy with as we age. So just live in the moment, give yourself the opportunity for your body to utilize the nutrients that you have in storage, because trust me, they are there, they're being stored away very efficiently. That's where intermittent fasting does come into play. It allows us the opportunity to use the nutrients that we have in storage so that the next feasting opportunity we have will support everything that we need for our tomorrow. And it'll, nice, it'll be nice and fresh and on the surface ready to use. So let me see if there's any questions here that you guys have. I'll get those answered for you. If you're a calorie counter, I want you to leave me a comment uh, in the comment section below. I want to give you some encouragement to try a different way. If you've kicked the calorie counting, uh, then let me know as well, because I want to make sure that you're on the right track with uh, figuring out what you need to do in your feasting window. The other thing I want to touch on really quickly is the idea of calories in versus calories out and why that's also catching us off guard as well. If you're counting calories to the calorie and you're, you, you're burning off calories to try to offset or create a deficit, the thing that we have to also take into consideration is this is a very factual and um, absolute number and this number is absolute but not factual right so you're taking in x amount of calories but you're not really even sure that the calories that you took in are being absorbed or used by your body properly and then the calories that you're attempting to burn off that you ate 
are not also are not as accurate as we uh, were led to believe, right? So just counting calories on your fitness tracker is not an indication that you actually efficiently burned off those calories. So in either one of those instances, you could be really fooling yourself into either not eating enough or over exercising and that's generally what happens is we tend to eat less and exercise more trying to make up and what i really want us to think about is feasting for our tomorrow so how do we want our body and health to be supported tomorrow and exercising for how it is we want to show up in our life physically in our future as well we cannot undo the past and we can't chase away a meal with exercise our exercise should really uh, be intended um, and gone into with the mindset of we're preparing our body to show up for itself tomorrow in a physical way and not trying to use it as a means to burn off food that we ate that maybe we had a regret about or that we're trying to get rid of because that's not the way our body is supposed to work but that's what we were led to believe. Cheryl, good to have you with us girlfriend. Hopefully Hawaii is treating you well. Sandra, October 2020, Brad, glad to catch you live. Girlfriend's always good to have you with us. Tina, from Florida, class of 2017. Love this info. Still fasting daily, 18 to 22 hours. I still count the calories I eat, though. I'm careful to eat a lot of nutrient-dense food and minimal sugar and carbs. Knowing my calories encourages me to work out hard. Um, I love this lifestyle and feel great. I definitely splurge on chips and guacamole on occasion and then do a long fast the next day. Yeah, so Tina, just make sure, too, with your workouts that you're working out in a way that's going to not just undo food, but actually prepare your body for tomorrow as well. Um, you want to make sure that you're finding that joy in your working out and it's not a punishment to undo something. Um, so make sure you got that mindset when you're uh, when you're going into your workouts. And then um, let's see who we got here. Margie, I think it was. Oh, Mari, Mary, Marie. Well, I don't know why I had a hard time with that. Marie's my middle name. Watching. Awesome girlfriend. A Marine assessing nutrition instead of counting calories. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Like you can, if, if you're a foodie, like I'm a foodie, I absolutely love food, uh, which some people don't believe because I fast, you know, 20 hours a day or 18 hours a day, but I absolutely love food. I love the social aspect of food. I love the taste of food. I love what food does to my body. I love how I can use food to manipulate how I feel and what my body looks like. I love it all. Um, and I want to eat food. Like I don't want, I didn't like when I was dieting and eating all day. And I felt like I was eating a, like a bird, like tiny little snacks throughout my day. When I sit down to eat, I want to eat a meal. Right. And so the more nutrient dense the food is that I choose to eat, the more of that food I get to eat. And that's really where I get pleasure with food. And one of the big aha moments I had with intermittent fasting was that I didn't have to eat out of little tiny baggies or containers anymore. I actually got to sit down and eat a plate full of food because I was eating for the nutrient support. I wanted that food to provide my body. And I wasn't eating it as a way to limit the amount of calories that I was consuming. So if you enjoy food, eating for nutrient density is a more satisfying way to live your life than managing calories for sure. Um, Tracy, good afternoon from Michigan. Good to have you. She's a 2018 grad. Tracy, I feel like my body is speaking another language. Tracy, tell me what you mean by that. What kind of language is it speaking to you? Uh, Teresa, nope, not counting calories, just counting hours fasted. September 2018 grad. Yes, girlfriend, that's a great thing to count. Uh, counting your hours fasted. I don't know if I told you guys here on Monday, but I spent 80% of the first week of um, 2021 in a fasted state. And I'll tell you what, it was the best gift I gave myself. Uh, this week I'm fasting a little bit less. I'm, tr I'm testing some things out to kind of see how my body chemistry adapts. But 80% of my time in a fasted state, I didn't count one calorie. I didn't count one macro. I ate food to support the energy that I wanted to have for myself. I ate the food that I wanted to support the sleep that I want to have for myself. And I ate the food that supports the fitness that I want to have for myself. And that is a really fun way to enjoy food for sure. So counting the hours you fast is a definite thing that you want to be counting for sure. Uh, Marie, um, uh, Venice, I think she said, Oh, I think you guys are friends. Well, awesome. Janine, um, I needed to hear this topic today. Thanks so much. Yeah, for sure. And if you guys still, if you're within the year of having your intimate fasting for today's aging woman course, go back and listen to the lesson on why you no longer have to count calories and it'll remind you about all of this and how simple it is. If you just trust your body and listen to the hormonal signs and signals that your body sends you when you're eating nutrient dense food, it's fascinating to let your body I'll lead the way on that for sure. Um, 
Let's see, Lisa, focus. I did not count calories. I try to go, I try to focus on nutrient, nutrient dense foods, no added sugar. There you go. Uh, Juanita, uh, check this out. I found it very interesting. She's also on YouTube. Okay, thank you for recommending your friend to watch for sure. Maureen, what are nutrient dense foods? So nutrient dense foods are usually, uh, the way I describe nutrient dense foods are one ingredient foods that are as close to their natural state as possible. So this is where I think a lot of us got duped into clean eating. So clean eating is um, is, is a phrase you you really can't find a definitive definition to. And it it you know for for people who are gluten free, clean eating or is just eating stuff with no gluten in it. Or people who are dairy free, being clean eating would be eating food with no dairy in it. So you get to define really what clean eating is. And a lot of clean eating um, we fell into because of new. Uh, of marketing labels and not really nutrition labels, right? So we 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 paid attention to the front of the packaging and we didn't turn it around and read the back of the packaging. So clean eating to me is how we get duped by the food industry. So nutrient dense foods are foods that have more nutrients in them, I guess, than they would have calories. If you want to, if you want to say it like in that sense, but it's going to provide you with more nutrition than anything else. So the the less the least amount of ingredients in it is going to be the more nutrient dense. And it's just going to provide you with everything that that food is and not have a lot of other things in there that are going to throw you off track. It's like how I consider nutrient dense foods for me. So lots of um, fresh vegetables. Um, you know, if you do dairy, like a dairy, that's not going to um, cause you any kind of signs and signals that you're intolerant to it. Um, a lot of unprocessed or minimally processed food would also be considered nutrient dense for sure. It just kind of depends on what food genre you uh, you categor categorize yourself in for sure. Uh, Marie, I look forward to having a good meal after fasting for 18 plus hours. Yeah, for sure. If you fast for 18 plus hours, uh, your body will not let you have a bad meal. You will feel the effects of making some uh, less than nutrient dense choices for sure. Your body will just, your digestive system will just totally um, discard what you just put in it. So uh, fasting for 18 plus hours, you want to make sure that you're putting nutrient dense food in so that your body will just absorb everything because it's going to be ready to take in all those nutrients for sure. Heather, I think of clean eating as fresh seasonal real food. You, um, your clean eating is tiny multi. I don't care what that means. I don't care what you're saying. I think there's some typos in there. And then Marie, um, I fast between 18 to 30 hours, much longer than that. I find it too hard. Yeah, I, f I feel like fasting outside of intermittent fasting is really personality based and lifestyle based. So, um, and if you do fat, if you fast consistently, if you intermittent fast consistently and are really paying attention to the nutrients that you're putting in your body, then intermittent fasting is enough for most people for sure. Um, Juanita, what time of the day do you generally break your fast? It depends on how long I'm fasting. Um, so, um, and then that'll determine how many meals I have in a day. So when I'm fasting 20 hours, I usually, we broke our fast today at two, but I fasted like almost 19 hours today. If I was breaking my fast at the 20 hour mark, I would do it right when I got done hanging out with you guys. Um, Josefina from uh, Wisconsin, September 2020 grad. Good to have you with us. And then Maureen, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for a perfect response to my question. Yeah, you're welcome. For sure. Hopefully it was perfect. Uh, it's hard to get perfect. It's hard to give perfect answers to questions about nutrition because um, perfection is really hard to achieve when it comes to nutrition because we all have our own DNA. We all have our own body ha chemistry. We all have our own food stories. We all bring to the table a, such a different set of, you know, things that we're trying to, to, um, get comfortable with in our own body and our own life. So I try to give as much generalized information as I can so that you can go away and then make the final decision for yourself. Um, so I don't like to dictate anything here. I just like you to go away considering some options for yourself, asking yourself questions like, how is this working for me? Or how has that thing been working for me that I may be holding on to really tightly and I don't want to let go of? Or, you know, how long am I fasting today? How well am I feasting today? All of those all of those questions are questions we should be asking ourselves every single day. And when you get really good at answering those things based on how you want to look and feel and how authentic you want to live your life, then the food aspect of fasting long and feasting well becomes very, very simplified because you won't 
ever want to put anything in your body that you can't honestly answer those questions for, for sure. Sandra, the 20 hour fasts are really uh, leading me to enjoy good quality, nutritious foods. I've been incorporating lots of clean eating. Yeah, Sandra, it's amazing. Um, the longer, longer meaning the time frame in which you're fasting as far as months and years um, really does simplify food because you won't want to or your body really won't let you put bad food in it uh, or food that doesn't agree with you uh, too many times before you before you start to clue into things not working for you. And then you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? When I do this, I feel great. And when I do this, I feel bad. Why am I settling for bad once I know what good feels like, right? And so, you know, I always say that there, you know, there's no food worth having a bad day for. Um, and and you have to make that mindset shift. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to do things perfectly or we're not going to enjoy fun food or have the cake or have the cookie or have the margarita or whatever. No, we give ourselves permission leading into that. Of, I'm going to have a margarita today and I know I'm going to feel this way at the, at the back end of it, but that's okay. I'm going to drink more water tomorrow, fast longer tomorrow. I'm going to celebrate my son's wedding and have the piece of wedding cake and I'm going to enjoy it and be mindful and present where I'm at. And that's just part of what we do as a family. Or maybe I'm going to have half a piece of cake or maybe I'm just going to have a bite. But I think once we get that habit down of having the conversation in our own head and deciding what we're going to do beforehand and knowing what we're leading into really does allow us to come out of those situations um, situations unharmed, right? We spend a lot of time damaging ourselves with our own thoughts about decisions we make about food. And if you make them on the front end and negotiate with yourself about why it's important for you to have that thing, then we come out the back end feeling so much better emotionally and mentally for sure. Um, no calorie counting, no macros, just trying to eat quality and clean. Yeah, for sure. And remember, clean is what you define as clean. Clean is not an industry standard. Clean should be not someone what someone else tells you clean eating is. You determine clean. So clean eating should mean that you eat food that doesn't cause you to look and feel any other way than great, right? And so I talk about a lot of the foods that I determined are not clean for me. Um, and they probably wouldn't fall into what people think are you know, not clean foods, but they just cause me to have a reaction that I don't like. And then that's what you do for you. And then you just put those foods on the, you know, not clean list. And those are the ones that you avoid for sure. Linda, I stop eating around 5 p.m. Eat usually 16 to 18 hours later. It works for me. Linda, I think that that's fantastic. Um, I think everyone should really figure out what is authentic for them. And then that's the lifestyle that you can live very easily uh, for the rest of your life. And that is freedom for sure. So congratulations. Congratulations for figuring that out. Connolly, I am overeating a little bit when I break my fast since I'm only eating one time a day. I am just learning. I get so excited about what I'm going to eat, fixing it, planting, uh, plating it, and eating it. Sometimes overload on veggies and eat too much. Ugh. Okay, so what's the ugh? Do you feel bad? Do you feel like you're eating too fast? Are you are you consuming food too quickly that you don't get the, the signal that you've had enough? Um, you know, figure all of that out and figure out why it is you're eating that way when you break your fast. And, and if it's not something that you're happy with, and it's not something that feels good to you, then maybe eating only one time a day isn't working for you. So a one meal a day type of protocol protocol for intermittent fasting is not the be all end all. And if you enjoy food and you like the, the process of plating it and all of those kind of things and preparing it, then eating just one time a day might not be the protocol for you. And if you broke it up over a two to three hour period, even you might find that you're enjoying it a little bit more and that you're not feeling like you're overeating and feeling ugh at the end for sure. Uh, probably too fast and overly excited. Yeah, I would break it up. I mean, even a two hour feasting window is a really minimal amount of time to eat in a day where you can break your meals up into a couple and then slowly integrate food back into your window before you have to close it out again. The thing you don't want to do is, you know, what I really warn women um, about is becoming food phobic or scared of your feasting window. So you don't want to feel like you're going to be ravenous when you're consuming your feast during your feasting window. And if you are ravenous, then what you're doing in your fasting window might not have set in yet. You should really feel like when you eat, it's just a very calm, 
controlled type of event and you eat for the nutrients and you close it back out. So if you're ravenous and anxious and nervous about eating, I would check into what's going on up here and make sure that what you're doing in your fasting windows supporting your feast as well. And then the feast that you're having is actually supporting your fast. And sometimes little tweaks in both of those two areas can really change how that break fast is going for you. And then Juanita, is your course safe for recovering food disorders? I'm asking for me, anorexia and bulimia in my early 20s and now in my late 40s. Um, that's one of those things that I that I have to say is um is very personal to your situation. I would say if you're currently undergoing maybe some treatment for an eating disorder, I would make sure that I got that done and you felt like you were pretty stable with it. Um, eating disorders are so different for so many different women. I know that there have been women who have gone through our course and have shared with me that they had been diagnosed with an eating disorder and they felt that the way um, intermittent fasting was taught inside of our course helped them. Um, and so I can only go off of that. And then people who've had eating disorders and come and gone and didn't say anything to me, I don't know. So I know that there have been several women who have been diagnosed with eating disorders, had gone through treatment and taken, taken the course, and they felt like the way it was taught gave them permission to kind of do their own thing. So I would say you have to kind of know how you're feeling about where you are in your journey. And then I always recommend that you go into the course very open minded and listen to the information, let it soak in and don't feel pressured to do anything that doesn't feel comfortable for you. So I hope that helps for sure. And then Marie, I am so hungry, I might overeat, but I'm finding after doing that, I'm not really hungry later on. Um, so there's a thing that we have in our community or a saying, I guess it is, which we're going to get some shirts for, and it's called the hungry is where the magic happens, right? So hungry is a, is a feeling or a sensation that once you understand why you're feeling it, you can get a sense of calm from it. So we have a hungry is where the magic happens. Once you understand what the magic of hungry is in your fasted state, you lose that nervousness and sort of anxiety and panic about it. And then what happens is you transition to what we call the energized sense of calm. So that's when you're in your fasted state and your body is internally producing energy that is very calm and controlled, but you're energized. So it's the exact opposite of what like um, a hypoglycemic type spell would be where you're feeling nervous and weak and, and hangry. It's just the opposite of that. You feel hungry, but energized and you're very calm about everything. And your mental clarity is like on point and you're super focused and you can get a bunch of stuff done and you're not relying on food to support that energy. It's all coming from the internal aspect of what fasting does for you. So if you're that hungry leading into your break fast, I would consider what it is you're doing in your fasting window. Why don't you have that energized sense of calm? And then what are you doing in your feasting window? Um, you should should feel satiated at the end of your feasting window, but you shouldn't be putting yourself in a predicament where you're scared to end your feast because you might get hungry later. All of those things should not even be a thought for you if you're fasting long and feasting well. So that's what you want to make sure that you're thinking about for sure, uh, Marie, it, with what it is you're doing with your intermittent fasting. Okay, so I got to run. I'm supposed to be sticking to a 30 minute schedule. I hope you'll take this information and you'll think about it. Calories were really discovered in the 1800s. Y'all, food has changed so much since then. Then, right our bodies we know so much more our, about our bodies since the 1800s and we also know that the food industry has really manipulated things like calorie counts and nutrition labels and we're being duped by a lot of that add in the diet industry and we're just suckers for what it is we're being told to do that's not working for us and we can't find our way out. So we don't wanna be suckered anymore. I was suckered myself. I used to be a coach that taught women to eat breakfast and 1200 calories a day and six meals in between. I was part of that as well. The most freeing thing I ever did for myself was give myself the opportunity to change my mindset about that and think a different way about caring for my body. And fortunately, I had to do it in a pre-diabetic state. I hope you won't end up in that same situation. So ask yourself the right questions. How is this working for me? 
Why am I doing something that doesn't feel like it's working for me? Should I start fasting? Should I look at nutrients? Why do calories matter so much to me? And then figure out if you can create a lifestyle for you that you're not going to be so consumed mentally, emotionally, and time-wise by tracking something that was never designed to be worked that way anyway. And then you can free yourself up and just enjoy yourself around the food that you choose to eat. It is very, very freeing for sure. Uh, Juanita, thank you so much. Yes, I did undergo treatment years ago, but find that some diets trigger me. Well, I don't teach a diet. We actually say intermittent fasting is not a diet. It's a timing thing. So we're introducing uh, food in a way that creates the chemical and hormonal response in our body that we desire to have. That's exactly how I introduced the course. It is not a diet. It's a timing thing. And once you understand the timing thing, then the food restriction and limitations go away and you really can just eat the foods that serve you best. So hopefully we'll see you in class with us when we uh, when we start at the end of this month. Thanks so much for joining me today, you guys. I love having these conversations with you. I love it when you guys participate. Make sure if you're catching this on the replay that you also uh, leave me a comment so that I can have a conversation with you as well. And I'll see you guys back here on Monday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a good weekend.